So can you guys hear me? All right, I'm gonna speak yeah. in this mic. Good, good, good. All right, I literally have like 20 minutes to get through a whole chapter of Daniel. So we're gonna be going like mock speed through Daniel, okay? First things first, I want you guys to know me a little more. I was gonna play a game. We don't have time for this game, so I'm gonna tell you what these things are. <clears throat> All right, you guys play two truths and a lie? Yeah. Do, you, do you guys wanna guess really quickly which are the two truths and which are the lies? So, uh, I toured France with my college band. I once made Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and I was a bouncer for MMA fighting in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Which one? Two. So the second one yeah. is a is a what? Five. Ooh, that's right. Actually, where's my wife? Beautiful woman with a beautiful baby. You should give this man candy. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, that's that's really impressive. Yeah, this is not fun anymore. <laughs> I'm kicking you out of chair here, go home. <laughs> um, no, so yeah, that is actually a lie. I did tour uh, France with my college band and I was a bouncer for MMA fighting in Atlantic City, New Jersey. So that was, that, all those things are true. Um, next. This is my wonderful family, my beautiful wife, my handsome son, he gets his good looks from my wife, not me. <laughs> Um, I love them. They're my precious, precious family. And uh, my son, you could see him. He's uh, eight months old, eight and a half months old, actually. And um, he was born in October. And I'm a new dad. I don't get any sleep. And uh, I feel like everything is in mock speed when you have a kid because you have to be everywhere all the time. So anyway, that's a little bit about me. Um, a couple more things. My wife was also uh, in um, music ministry. She was a music director at her church. She uh, also went to school for music and then switched to social work. Um, and you guys know me. I've been in music ministry in the church for a little over 10 years now. So that's me, me, my wife, and my son Judah. So thanks for having us. This is my first time at Chehi. Like, I've never been here before, so. <clears throat> so I said, we're going to be talking from Daniel, okay? And like I said, I'm not into the weird revelation stuff. I, I can't interpret those things. They're, they're so contested. But what I want to talk about is the narrative of Daniel with you guys, all right? So if you have your Bibles, open up to Daniel chapter 1. We're going to be going through uh, chapter by chapter throughout the week. Um, we'll be doing chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and then we're going to jump ahead to 6 because we love the story of Daniel and Lions Den um, at the end of the week. So today we're in chapter 1, all right? I'm going to start... <clears throat> Reading here uh, in the middle of, of this ch of this chapter, we have um, Daniel resolved that he won't defile himself with the king's food. Okay, so he says, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him to not defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are your, of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Test your servants for 10 days. Let us uh, be given f vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of our youths who eat the king's food be observed by you. And deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and wine and they were to drink and um, they, they were to drink and gave them vegetables. That sounds delicious for three whole years, just vegetables. So why did I pick Daniel? Uh, yesterday I talked to you guys about um, just some of my own study. Uh, this beginning of this summer and I, thinking about coming here, Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we know, they were your age. You know, they were maybe a little older than you, but 
they were your age and they stood strongly. They, they were firm and courageous in their faith. And so um, one of the, I think your Chehi verse is Jeremiah 17, right? 7 to 8. And um, it, is, it is that trusting in God that allows us to be sh uh, firm and courageous, to be brave by faith, even, like I said, from that book that I was reading by Alistair Begg. And so if there's anything I want you guys to leave with this morning and to talk throughout the day and to think about when you're reading that Jeremiah passages, being brave by faith means trusting that God is in control. Okay? Trusting that God is in control. And so, have any of you experienced crisis? Like, major crisis. We should all be shaking. We just went through Big Rona. Like, that was the well, like largest crisis, I think, that all of us have experienced, all right? What did you learn about yourself? I mean, well, let's look at the past year. It has definitely shaped us and will continue to do so. In the same sense, the book of Daniel opens up with a giant crisis, guys. All right. As I read earlier, and if you know the story of Daniel, we're in the third year of the reign of uh, Jehoiakim. He was the king of Judah. The Jewish people are living in the land of, of promise that God has given them, which is Judah. But Nebuchadnezzar, remember the guy who likes to make giant chocolate bunnies out of himself? Yeah, that guy, that guy took all the Jewish people, destroyed the temple, completely eviscerated, I mean, just killed everything and, and took and kidnapped the people of Israel. Now Babylon is the greatest empire in the whole land. And so before they kind of took over, the Jewish people were, oh, no, no need to freak out. We, we've seen this before. God's going to come in. He's going to take care of things. But they were warned, guys. They were, they were explicitly warned. God says, if you continue to deny me and only give lip service, meaning if, if you are to just continue to live the way you want to live and not obey me, there's going to be a reckoning. And I'm going to take the thing that I promised to you. They didn't listen. So then Babylon came in. God allowed Babylon. He was in control of Babylon to punish the Jewish people. And so it happened. We read, we read in verse 2, The Lord gave Jeho Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. The king of Judah and almost all the Jewish people were taken into exile into Babylon. The temple was completely destroyed. All the treasures that were in the temple were now in the, uh, in the temple of the gods of Babylon. This is a big deal. This is probably the greatest crisis in, in um, God's people's history since Adam and Eve being kicked out of the garden. At this point, it looked like the gods of Babylon were stronger than our God, the God of the Bible. I mean, come on, how could this happen? This is what is going through the, the people of Israel's mind at this point. And if we're honest with ourselves, this kind of thing happens all the time today. We see it happen to others, even in our own lives, in the questions that we ask ourselves. We say, where is God in the middle of all this trouble? All the things that you guys are going through, things that I'm sure your parents and your, your leaders here and your, um, your, your teachers never would have imagined even their own kids going through the stuff that's been going on. So what is going on? Where is God in this? How did, did we follow him for nothing, even though we know what has probably brought this on? And so the same questions had to be ringing in the minds of the Jewish people also. See, these young men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, at this point, them being taken into exile, they were taken into the land of Babylon. And guess what? They would have known their Bibles. They would have known that this same land is the same place that the Tower of Babel was built. You guys know that story? Tower of Babel? What happens in Tower of Babel? Boom. You're right. The people of the earth are like... Yo, God, we got this, bro. We get, listen, we, we know how to live our lives. You don't got to tell us how to live our lives. We got this. Uh, we're, in fact, going to just build a giant, giant tower. 
and call ourselves God? And he was like, oh, heck no. What does he do? Topples it and then completely changes everybody's languages. They don't even know how to speak to each other. Some, some guy's speaking Mandarin over here and the other guy's speaking horrible American English. He's like, bleh, bleh, bleh. and they were like, what, what, what is going on? They don't have any idea what they're saying and thus the Tower of Babel. And so they would have known this. They said, how could we even survive this land, this just travel here? How could we even make it? How could the Jewish people survive at all, let alone survive in their own faith? I bring this back to today again. We've experienced so many crises this past year. A pandemic, social unrest, political unrest, division in the church, deaths of family members and friends. It's hard to share faith with your own friends, you know, being made fun of in your own schools or being um, made fun of by your friends because you believe in Jesus. I, like I said yesterday, I was talking to Ian and um, a completely different scenario when I was in high school. At least we could talk about Jesus without being completely ostracized. You see, friends, the book of Daniel is in fact a recount of what happened to the Jewish people in the heart of an empire that was completely set to destroy them and try to destroy their God. So when it feels like our world is more like Babylon than Jerusalem, this story reminds us how we can live in firm and courageous confidence in a world that seems so out of joint. So back to this crisis. You see, Nebuchadnezzar was a smart king, okay? He, he knew to grow his kingdom and his empire that he had to do something. He told his chiefs and his stewards, you know what? Take the best of the Jewish people. Take the best of the people that we, that we um, kidnap, and then we're going to re-educate them. We're going to relocate them. We're going to rename them for the sake of building his own kingdom. And, and in fact, it, it worked a lot. He had the best and wisest men of all the lands. But that's a kind of a scary reality for the people of Israel, right? Some of you guys may be here for the first time. I don't know how you um, junior hires or feel about being away from home, but have you ever felt scared and alone and afraid because you were, you were away from everything that you knew? Everything that you were comfortable with? This is how Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell. Guys, here's the danger. Because it happens all the time. I have friends who go and just a simple relocation of going into university, into college, where they grew up in the church. They knew. They knew the Bible. They've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And yet, at the end of their experience or at the beginning of the experience, they completely left Jesus. Like, I don't want anything to do with him. I think, like the Tower of Babel, I think I know what I'm going to do with my life. I don't want any of this. As I said before, they were re-educated. Y'all, what you read and listen to, I want you guys to take note of this, what you read and you listen to and how you think changes who you are. I think we can all, you guys are at a music camp, I think we can all come to a place and say, you know what, music is important, and it definitely shapes the type of person you are. So the type of music that you listen to at home, the type of things that you read at home, the, the way you think about how the world, how you interact with the world, guess what, it, it, that changes you. And they knew this. And so they were re-educated, they were, they were relocated, they, they were made to read, not even their own languages. Completely new, completely new books and new, new texts. They were renamed. And so all this stuff happened. They were, they were given all this stuff. And then the last thing that was to change is they were to eat the, food, the king's food. And this is where Daniel said no. Daniel said no. Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. That's verse 8. 
They could not stop from being kidnapped or they could not stop from uh, resisting re-education. They couldn't stop themselves with being forced upon with new names. But Daniel was like, I'm not eating the food that you give me. This is a weird stance to take, but if you know anything about your Bibles, is that one of the things in God's law is the type of foods that the people of Israel ate. And it was an external outworking. It was, it was how they showed their desire to serve God in, what, in how they ate. So he resolved that he wouldn't. This is a strange thing to do, but he drew the line. Him and his buddies, they were like... This isn't happening. This was the last thing that they could hold on to for their Jewish roots. And Daniel and his friends were good students, though. They sought favor with the chief of the eunuchs. We see that in verse 9. And so what happens here is that he, he resolves to talk to the chief eunuchs. And he's like, yo, bro, I'm not eating that food. He's like, well... I want my head on my shoulders, so you're going to eat the food. He's like, no. He goes to the steward, and he says, listen, you put us to the test. You put us to the test. In 10 days, see that we look better than the rest of the other students. I want, I want to do a quick reminder here, too. I'm not trying to get you guys to be like Daniel. You're not the biblical characters in the Bible. You're not David. You're not Daniel. I, I want us to realize something here. I want you and I to take a, a serious look at the God that Daniel believed in. To trust in the God that Daniel believed in. To believe in that same God. Don't be a, like a dead fish that goes along with the current. I want you to be a living fish that swims against the tide. That's what Daniel was. So now they have drawn this line completely. Daniel and the boys need to convince the chief eunuchs to eat different food. And he does. He, he, he convinces the steward, 10 days, 10 days, give us the test and see that we're not better. I, I think this is so funny because maybe you're leaders will know and um, your counselors you guys remember the Daniel diet remember that book that came out yes. I think it's I, I think it's I think it's hilarious because they so they eat vegetables for 10 days and they're fatter than the people that eat the, the meat and the wine I think that's counterproductive a little bit to a diet right that's not like you, you generally don't eat more vegetables and say man that dude's huge that doesn't happen, right? So, but that's, what, that's exactly what happens. See, this, this story is not a diet plan. It's a miracle of God. They, they, it was completely counterintuitive to the way the Babylonians thought about everything. And so when they desired to eat vegetables, guess what? They were better looking. They were fatter than the, than the rest of the students. And then they were allowed to eat vegetables for the next three years of their training and re-education. This is a miracle. They trusted. They, they knew. They were like, it's just a big deal, God. I, I have to trust you here because, listen, we're eating vegetables. We know we're not going to get fat off vegetables. You're the only one that can do this. And at the end of the 10 days, God came through. They trusted him. I want you guys to notice a few things here. God is in control. I got two minutes, Graham. I'm paying attention right now. I'm, I'm mock speed. God is in control. And we know this because God gave at multiple different points. Verse 2, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand of, of the king of chocolate bunnies. He gave, like, took over Judah. God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief eunuchs. God also gave Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego learning and skill and all literature and wisdom. He is in control. You see, friends, God is in control. God had all of this in the palm of his hands as we, as we sang when we were little kids. He's got the whole world in his hands. 
working it all out for his own purposes because he is good. Imagine at the end of the three years of training when they walked before the king and the Babylonians. They would have thought, man, our, our program's really great. No. God. God did this. The same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was still in control and still in control today. It's the same God today that we believe in. And in the same way Daniel drew his lines, refusing to move in the face of a powerful enemy, we see future that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, did the same before an enemy who was not going to win, Satan. And he conquered sin and death, and he drew his lines in a foreign land, in a world where God was born as a baby and held in the hands of his creation lived a perfect life, died a wrongful death, and rose again to save you and I so that we can come to Chehi. So that we can, you know, use our faith in our music and our talents. So I want to remind you guys of something. The emphasis here in Daniel is not really about Daniel. It's about God. If you want to be brave by faith, if you want to stand firm and courageous, trust that God is in control. Trust Him. Love Him. Read about Him. Pray to Him. And when you find that life is so disjointed as it has been like in this story for Daniel and his buddies, be comforted and reminded about the truth of who God is for us. The God who is in control. He will make us brave. He will make you firm and courageous. And as we read in Jeremiah, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, who trusts is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Guys, be firm and courageous. Micah's going to kill me because I'm over time. Use this time, use this time at Chehi, hone your talents, and be brave by faith. All right.